growth in women's imprisonment. Um, again, uh, a phenomenon that's not unique to Australia, that uh, the growth in women's imprisonment has been outstripping uh, the growth in male imprisonment. So 40% uh, increase there over a decade from 97 to 2007 for men, uh, and an 80% increase for women. Okay, so what I want to move on to um, now is really just one aspect of this project. From the very beginning, uh, you know, this was never simply an academic exercise. Uh, I think all of us uh, that are involved in this project have, in various ways have had a long-term commitment um, to bringing about change within the criminal justice system, either specifically in prisons or more generally. And so one of the issues that we've been concerned with continually from the very beginning was this question about how do we engage the public? And that's what I want to uh, talk a little bit more about um, this morning as my part of this overall report. How do we engage the public? How do we intervene? How do we shift the debate? How do we mobilise consent for rethinking the prison? The sort of questions that we're all concerned with, I think, uh, on a day-to-day -day uh, day -day basis and one that um, you know, there's clearly no easy answer to. So I really want to talk a little bit about how uh, we've been engaged uh, with this. Um, we haven't just been, uh, I guess, in, concerned with engaging with the public. We've also been engaging with prisoners and prisoners organisations uh, through groups like, like Brett, uh, Brett Collins and Justice Action, through Demi Kilroy and Sisters Inside. We've also been engaging with lawyers uh, that work with prisoners and practitioners and uh, and judicial officers. I think one of the things that's been very interesting with this work is the, the level of disquiet amongst the judiciary in terms of the way the criminal justice system is, is developing. At one level, we can say quite clearly that the only way you can end up in prison if someone is, is if either you're refused bail by a judi judicial officer or a judge sentences you to imprisonment. So there's a very clear connection between the growth of imprisonment and the judiciary. But at the same time, I think there is a very clear uh, and often publicly articulated concern by members of the judiciary about the use of the prison, the way it's developing uh, and the impacts on it. So in terms of engaging in public debate, the strategy um, has been to focus on financial costs and opportunity costs, social costs, um, the failure of the prison to ensure public safety, the limitations of the prison as a crime control measure and the prospects for justice reinvestment. Now these are all um, I think fairly reformist uh, positions to argue, um, but we are arguing, arguing them very clearly, I think, in terms of engagement, to try and find a point, a point of leverage into uh, the debate. I'm not going to talk about all of those, but I'll, I'll just mention some of them. Yeah, sure. As anyone who is, uh, works in public relations uh, and the media will tell you, you have to have a book. You know, if you want to engage in a debate, you've got to have a hook. You've got to be able to get in there. And uh, the hook that we've been using to try and generate public discussion uh, has been a different contrast to the ones that I've mentioned already, but the contrast between New South Wales and Victoria. And for those of you who know Australia, will know there are, there's a great deal of similarities between those two states. They border each other, um, similar populations. But the... The prison rate in Victoria is just over half that of New South Wales, 103 per 100,000 in, in Victoria compared to 184 in New South Wales. Two similar states, uh, but uh, with very different um, imprisonment rates. So, you know, states with similar social demographic profiles, a um, bit over 7 million people living in New South Wales, about 5.5 million in Victoria. Two largest cities in Australia, Sydney and Melbourne, are in those two states. Um, very similar racial and ethnic diversity, so that racialisation factor in itself is not something that you can use to explain the different <coughs> prison rates. Um, and a little more than half the total population of Australia. So very similar states in terms of their social demographic profile, but very different states in terms of the use of imprisonment. So as I said, the imprisonment rate in Victoria is, a, is about half that of New South Wales. So that has been um, a hook, if you like, to engage in some debate about imprisonment, what drives imprisonment, figures why is it so different. And the second part of it that we've been using, following on from that, 
is the issue of, of the unsustainable current growth in New South Wales. And the question of sustainability, I think, is, is one that you can particularly argue at the moment, given uh, the issues around uh, uh, the current crisis uh, in terms of capitalism. So the daily average number of prisoners in full-time custody now, the daily average number is well over 10,000, has been for uh, a little over 12 months. The point that we've used to argue in relation to that is simply that if you continue with a 5% per annum growth, which is what has been occurring over the last 20 years, you reach a threshold figure. And for us in that particular state, threshold figure of 10,000 means that with 5% growth, you have to build a new 500 bed prison every year just, just to keep up with the, with the annual growth. And I think that's been a useful way of, of concentrating, if you like, both government and public attention to this issue. Do we want to continue on this path where we must build uh, in that state a new prison uh, every 12 months? Um, we've fudged it, I suppose, to some extent in, in, in that, you know, if we think back 10 years ago uh, in Australia and many other jurisdictions, a 500 bed prison would have been seen as a relatively large prison. Today it's not. Um, you know, what was large is now seen as a as more of average in terms of size. Of the same thing I noticed here with the announcement here with the 2,000 bed prison. Uh, Australia is also moving now to building much larger prisons uh, to try and alleviate the cost uh, of imprisonment. But anyway, it was a, uh, an issue there about sustainability. Can we go on devoting resources in the state to a new prison every 12 months? Um, there's also some very direct causes, I think, of, of penal excesses in one state compared to another. Greater use of full-time imprisonment. We know that if you uh, do a break and enter, if you uh, do a house burglary, um, that you're much more likely to be sentenced to imprisonment in New South Wales compared to Victoria. So, um, and that goes across a range of offences, from, from sex offences uh, through to property offences uh, and others. So, 77% um, likely to be incarcerated in Victoria compared to 47%. So again, even states with similar issues around crime respond to them quite differently uh, in terms of the levels of imprisonment. We know that in New South Wales people are sentenced to imprisonment for longer periods of time. So not only are they more likely to be in prison, they're in prison for longer periods of time uh, than the neighbours across uh, the border. We know that the bail legislation has increased the remand population uh, compared to the neighbouring jurisdiction. And we know that in the neighbouring jurisdiction there's much greater use of court diversion processes and specialist courts that divert individuals uh, out of the criminal justice system and attempt to address issues like housing uh, or drug and alcohol issues. We also know um, that the other state that has a lower imprisonment rate has much better through care and post-release support. And one clear demonstrable effect of that is lower re-offending and re-imprisonment rates. So again, using that that uh, comparisons are way to kind of generate some of these issues about what can be done uh, to change the situation. Just in terms of costs, um, I want to say a little bit about financial costs, opportunity costs, and social costs um, as a way of uh, demonstrating. <coughs> financial costs, again, with this comparison, one state has 57 custodial facilities compared to a neighbouring state has 14. Um, very significant differences there. Um, one state spends over a billion dollars, the other spends less than 500,000. One state alone spends only 40% of the total national budget uh, on prisons. Okay, so very clear issues there around financial costs and the expenditure of public money. Uh, and I think that's important, uh, an important point to be able to argue. If you go on you know, talk back radio, if you're arguing to newspaper columns to say that well, this is where taxpayers' money is going. Uh, a large proportion of taxpayers' money is going. Um, and that translates very much into opportunity costs. So what we're doing at the moment is talking about opportunity costs. That, uh, and, you know, it's using kind of uh, bourgeois economics in a way, but uh, it, it's an important point, I think, in terms of raising these issues. That, you know, opportunity costs, accounts or economists will talk about, an opportunity cost is the cost of passing up an alternative when you make a decision. So, if a farmer grows a crop of potatoes, they forego the potential profit from a crop of carrots. Okay, so we're not talking about farmers, we're not talking about potatoes, we're not talking about carrots, we're talking about the state, the loss of liberty, 
uh, incarceration. But we can talk about what that means in relation to opportunity costs. What are we passing up by building prisons uh, and maintaining those operation, operating costs? What are we losing in terms of other social benefits, in terms of access and equity issues that might be seen as far more beneficial? So opportunity costs, I think, is an important way of, uh, of again, getting a handle on some of these arguments. So we're looking at construction costs at the moment. Um, a bed, uh, you know, these, these figures are about five years old, we're just trying to get some more current uh, figures on this at the moment. But to build a bed in a medium security prison costs about $222,268,000 to build that bed. To build a bed in a typical 250 bed hospital in Sydney costs $180,000. To provide a desk for a student, per student, in a, in a normal uh, level two school in Sydney costs about $8,000. So that's another way of thinking about these opportunity costs. What you what you spend in terms of the bed in the medium security prison is what you don't spend in terms of a hospital bed uh, or a school student's desk. Uh, and to put that graphically, you know, for every 100 prison beds, what you don't have is 150 hospital beds. Um, well, again, another comparison if you put in school desks, for every 100 prison beds, you, have, you don't have 150 hospital beds and you don't have 3,350 school desks. Uh, they're the opportunity costs that you forego uh, by relying on the prison. Um, and of course, these costs are not um, static. We know that the impact is ongoing, and so we're looking, we've been looking at expenditure in, in New South Wales um, it's, has risen by 10% over that five year period on prisons. Uh, expenditure on schools has declined over the same period of time by 0.5%. And expenditure in vocational educational training um, sector, adult education sector, vocational training sector, the very sector that you would think you would want to spend money in as an alternative to putting people in jail, um, has declined by 6% over that same period of time. So again, a way of, of, of attempting to demonstrate uh, not only the lost opportunity costs, but the com compounding nature of that in terms of money being drawn from other areas. Um, and again, just to put that graphically, uh, in terms of that five-year period of real or current expenditure going up on prisons, going down in schools, and going down in terms of vocational education training. 